Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to try to stay on time with our presentation. So I'm going to start and then Victoria will take over. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about the holistic approach to managing anxiety and depression. Um, in case you can't see us in the little box, this is who we are. Um, again, I'm Dr. West and I'm the Director of Outpatient Psychiatry here at Capital Health. Um, and Victoria is the Manager for Outpatient Clinical Social Work at Capital Health. So that, those are our faces in case you can't see us in the little boxes. Um, so I just want to mention uh, in terms of disclosures, we have neither Victoria nor I have any financial interest or affiliation with anything that we're discussing tonight, other than the fact that we're both employed by Capital Health. Um, and I wanted to just mention that our um, outpatient mental health um, services at Capital Health are um, called Capital Health Behavioral Health Specialists, and we see patients in two locations. Um, in Bordentown, New Jersey, and in Newtown, Pennsylvania. Um, and we provide comprehensive outpatient mental health treatment, including medications, variety of <laughs> types of psychotherapy, and other interventions, uh, specialized interventions. So at the end, I'll give you our contact information um, so that you have it. Um, but just to start tonight, I wanted to um, go through some of the terms in the title, actually. Um, so holistic is the first word in our title tonight, and I wanted to talk about what that is. Um, so when it comes to medicine, holistic medicine is the form of healing that considers the whole person, your body, mind, spirit, emotions. We consider everything as we're trying to treat you for any medical conditions and to help you have your optimal health and wellness. So instead of looking at someone who's coming in to see the doctor as just the person who has high blood pressure, the person who has diabetes, and just focus in on treating those uh, health conditions and the symptoms of them. It's taking into account all aspects of the person's life because we're, we're whole people. We're not just our symptoms and we're not just an organ system. Um, and any aspect of our life can be affecting other aspects of our life, including our health. Um, and this is especially important when it comes to preventing and treating anxiety and depression. So our holistic health is comprised of all aspects of us. And typically we put those into about seven different groups. Um, and within those groups, um, there are different interventions and treatments that we use to help uh, bolster that part of us. So there are seven um, sections, our physical health, our emotional health, our intellectual health, social health, environmental health, financial health, and spiritual health. Um, so we're, of course, going to be focusing largely on physical and emotional health, but we will also touch on all the other areas. And again, when it comes to depression, anxiety, all of these things are important to address if we want to have the best possible outcome for each person. So the next thing I wanted to, to define was depression, right? So we use the word depression all the time. Um, people say, oh, I'm so depressed, you know, um, you know, something happened today. Um, but that's not depression. Um, depression is not the same as sadness. We often think that depression is because, you know, is sadness. But sadness is really a typical human emotion. We all have it different times. It usually is in response to something unpleasant or bad happening. Um, even when we're sad, we typically can function in our life and do the things we need to do. Um, and the sadness tends to go away with time or with changes in our life. Depression um, is a medical illness. Um, it happens because of a life event in a person who is genetically susceptible. So a life event can be a good life event or a not good life event. So a stressor, whether it's um, you lost your job or um, you got married, you know, those are big changes in life and, and either either good or bad can be that life event that, can, that causes depression. Um, sometimes depression can come out of the blue. So it doesn't have to have an identifiable cause. And that typically happens in people who have a strong genetic predisposition to depression. Um, in order to actually be diagnosed with depression, your symptoms have to be bad enough that they interfere with your functioning in some way. Uh, it can be mild, you know, um, like maybe you're calling out more frequently from work. 
um, or you're not going out and socializing as much with friends, but it does have to change. Um, it has to be a change from your usual functioning. Um, and depression um, is, goes away when it's treated. And typically that involves some combination of medication and psychotherapy, both of which are best, but also additional adjunctive things that you can do, a lot of which we're gonna talk about today. Um, and certainly um, those things are very important in prevention and certainly in prevention of another episode of depression. So we'll get into that more. <clears throat> Just so you get a sense, like we, you know, the way we diagnose depression and a lot of mental health conditions is not like other things in medicine where you go see your doctor and they run a bunch of blood work and scan some things and then they have a diagnosis. Our diagnoses are based on meeting criteria. So for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, um, which is what we call depression clinically, um, it requires that you have five out of nine symptoms um, within the same two week period. So the important thing is a two week period because often people will have a couple really bad days and might have a lot of these symptoms, but then it kind of dissipates. We would not consider that depression. So the, the two most important that one has to have are a depressed mood and the second is loss of interest in the things that typically give you pleasure or the things that you typically um, are interested in doing. So you have to have those two and then three others and they can include changes in your appetite, um, changes in your sleep patterns, um, being very uh, unmotivated and having low energy, having trouble concentrating or being really indecisive, um, even having thoughts of death or suicide, um, and also being really slowed down. You know, even sometimes people are, when they're depressed, are quite slowed down such that they're talking really slow, they're slow to respond. So you have to have the first two and then three more for two weeks at least, um, and then you meet criteria if, B, your symptoms cause some impairment in your life, and that's what I talked about. And then it's not, your symptoms are not because you're using a drug or taking, you know, drinking too much or there's some other health problem or mental health issue. So that's how you get a diagnosis of depression. One time in your life, if you have this, you are considered to have major depressive disorder. And about 50% of people who have one episode will have another in their life. And after you've had three, the chances of having another um, are close to 100%. So that's depression. Um, it's very common. 300 million people around the world have depression. Uh, it's more common in women than men. Um, it is, um, you know, it's very treatable, but most people, or let's not say most, this says, this is from NAMI, and this is, um, you know, 35% of adults get, don't get treatment. I think that's a gross un underestimation of how many people don't get treated for depression. So it's really important to treat depression because um, suicide is a leading cause of death in people who are 10 to 34 years old. So um, it's, it's very um, disabling, um, and it, you know, it contributes to a lot of lost work time, lost lifetime. Um, most, 50% um, of people who have depression also have anxiety. Um, so they do occur together often. And depression just uh, isn't just an emotional health problem. It also affects our physical health. So people who have depression have um, a higher risk of dying if they have a heart attack. Um, they have weakened immune systems, they, their blood vessels tend to constrict, which causes all kinds of cardiovascular disease. Um, people who are depressed have increased pain sensitivities um, and affects all kinds of organ systems in our body. So it's really important, obviously, for us to treat depression and to try to prevent it. Um, and what is anxiety? Okay, anxiety is a, is a harder one, I think, in some ways to define because most of us have felt anxious at some point in our life. Um, so anxiety um, is our body's response. Um, it's a normal reaction to stress and, and we need it, right? So when we have the stress response, um, our body secretes all kinds of stress hormones, including cortisol. It causes that fight, flight, or freeze. And that's, that's good to have sometimes. Like if you're walking across the street and you see a bus barreling towards you, you want that system to jump on so you can get the energy and quickly get out of the way, right? So it's protective. But anxiety disorders, um, so anxiety becomes a problem when it's, 
it's not, it doesn't fall into a normal, the normal kinds of um, worries a person might have in a given situation, um, or you have excessive anxiety, or the anxiety, the anxiety doesn't turn off when the stressor kind of dissipates. Um, anxiety disorders are the most common mental health condition as a group. So about one in three of us in our life at some point will have an anxiety disorder. Um, so anxiety comes in, a. Um, oh, sorry, I'll go through this real quick. I kind of mentioned this, but everyday anxiety are things like you worry about paying your bills and, you know, about um, whether someone might break up with you in a relationship or um, if you're going to give a presentation, like I'm giving a presentation tonight, you might be worried about that or a little anxious. Um, people have fears of objects and things like those are phobias, right? Um, and um, people can have anxiety after a traumatic event. Those are kind of everyday anxieties and worries that, that um, you know, all of us have. Anxiety disorders, you know, are kind of take it up a level. So it's constant worry that's unsubstantiated or it's, it's more than you would expect given the cer uh, certain circumstances. Um, avoiding all social interactions because you're afraid of being judged, um, out of the blue getting a panic attack, and then having fears about having more panic attacks that alters your behavior in some way, um, you know, having um, irrational fears and recurring nightmares, flashbacks, things like that, that those are, um, uh, are not uh, typical everyday anxieties. They fall under the category of anxiety disorders. And we have a bunch of flavors of anxiety disorders. So there's generalized anxiety, which is kind of worried about excessive worry about all kinds of things. Panic disorder, when you have panic attacks that recur and then you're fearful you'll have more. The phobias I talked about, you're afraid of spiders or you know, heights or whatever. Um, agoraphobia is being afraid of being in situations that you can't get out of or escape. So, you know, a lot of people think agoraphobia means you stay home all the time. And that can happen with people with agoraphobia, but it really is like. Uh, a common thing is driving. So people who are afraid of driving on highways because they can't get off if they start to get anxious. Um, separation anxiety and then social anxiety is anytime you're in social situations or in um, situations where you have to perform in some way. Um, anxiety disorders, again, are extremely common. Um, about 40 million of American adults have uh, an anxiety disorder. Um, and generalized anxiety is quite common as a social anxiety. Um, so very, very common. Um, certainly some people who are joining us tonight have had this. Um, so anxiety also causes health problems, physical health problems. So people who have anxiety disorders have higher risk of heart disease, asthma, obesity, diabetes, headaches, gastrointestinal problems are very common when people are, have anxiety disorders sleep difficulties, problems with concentrating, and even premature death. So um, just like with depression, anxiety is an important medical problem. Um, anxiety disorders are important medical problems that we do have to treat um, for our overall health, not just our mental health. Um, I'm gonna call this our mountain peak slide because it'll come up a couple of times and that's what it looks like to me. Um, so these little peaks are the different um, areas in which we can intervene to prevent and treat depression and anxiety. So the green peak is medications, for example, like antidepressants. Um, blue is the lifestyle things. Orange is psychotherapy. And then social, uh, other social interventions that can help. Um, so we're gonna talk about each of these. Um, and I'm gonna uh, remind us of our beautiful color wheel here, which is again, when we're considering that your holistic health we're considering all these different aspects of your life. Um, so we're gonna start by looking at antidepressants, medications, and life, some lifestyle things, because um, those are the things that tend to um, be of like the physical health uh, nature. So physical health is our ability to maintain a fit and healthy body. Um, it's important for us to do certain things to do that, like, make sure that we're taking care of our preventative health care, getting to our annual physicals, going to our regular doctor's appointments, seeking care when you have a physical illness. Um, you know, a lot of times people have, you know, something's been bothering them, but they kind of just ignore it and hope it goes away. Um, not always the best idea. So certainly seeking care for anything like that. Um, if you have a chronic health condition, like high blood pressure, diabetes, 
um, high cholesterol, that you are adhering with your treatment for that. Um, very important for maintaining physical health. And then other things that are quite important um, are exercise, having a, a reasonably healthy diet and getting enough sleep. Um, so the medical treatments that we have for depression, so they fall under, um, you know, our physical health, um, include medications so that, it, um, you know, medications are um, the most studied um, treatments for depression. Uh, they work. Um, that not always the first one that you try works. So there's a little bit of, you know, art with that sometimes because each person might, re might respond better to a different medicine. Um, but medications are effective. Um, two different kinds of brain stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is an outpatient procedure. The lady in the chair on the bottom is getting this treatment um, where they use magnets to help stimulate uh, the brain in a specific place. That's a, a, a well-studied treatment for depression. Um, electroconvulsive therapy is another type of brain stimulation where seizures induced. Um, uh, ECT is the most effective treatment actually for depression, but it is something that we tend to not use first line um, uh, because it's quite involved. Um, and then we even have um, a form of ketamine called S-ketamine, which is an intranasal spray that's approved for treatment of depression. So these are, are different types of interventions that are, are specifically addressing the physical health aspects of um, depression. We have the same for anxiety. So there are medications for anxiety. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation has recently been approved for a type of anxiety disorder called obsessive compulsive disorder. And we also have biofeedback, which is what the gentleman in the lower picture is doing, um, where you use different physical parameters um, they're measuring and he is learning how to, um, you know, adjust how his body is responding um, by looking at the things on the computer and trying to get himself in at certain ranges for those. So that's kind of neat. And there is a lot of evidence that that can be helpful, especially for anxiety. Um, so <laughs> the other interventions, so, um, you know, lifestyle interventions are, um, you know, nutrition, certainly and exercise. So this little guy, uh, this cat, he says, I'm not out of shape because round is a shape. So this cat is quite overweight and this is obviously not good for his health, for her health. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about is the nutritional aspect. Um, so, you know, there's, there have been a lot of studies about what kinds of foods are uh, most helpful for depression and anxiety. There's, there's a lot of studies the, the evidence is there for some things. Um, a lot of, there are a lot of claims that you will hear all over the place that if you eat this food and it'll treat your depression or do this other thing. Um, the things that we do know work and are helpful are following a Mediterranean diet um, as opposed to the typical Western diet. So the Mediterranean diet again is um, really heavily based on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and healthy oils like olive oil. Um, then that's the basis of the diet. And then you have some um, fish um, for omega-3s and some beans and eggs and some dairy and to a lesser extent. And the smallest portion of the diet is red meat and a lot of processed foods and candy and sweets, right? So really trying to make the fruits and vegetables um, and whole grains the basis of um, your diet. Um, there is evidence that that is helpful for preventing um, and treating depression and anxiety. Um, most of us follow, some of us follow a more Western diet, which um, is really heavy on the processed foods and red meats and things like that. And we know that those actually can make anxiety and depression worse. So that's nutrition. Um, the foods that have the most evidence that they are directly helpful for depression are um, those that have vitamin D, vitamin B, omega-3 fatty acids, and zinc. Um, so, you know, vitamin D you find in that specific fish is a sardine. So sardines, mushrooms, eggs are some things that have vitamin D in them. Um, vitamin B is found in grains, um, some nuts, uh, salmon. We have clams there, we have organ meat. So I believe that's liver, um, you know, which is not everybody's favorite thing to eat. Um, Omega-3s come from uh, tofu, um, some healthy oils and healthy fatty fish. Um, and then zinc comes from some kind of random things like um, some of the mollusks that we eat, squid and mussels. So 
these things are the ones that have been studied that have the most evidence that they're helpful for depression. Um, it's always best to get your vitamins and nutrients from food as opposed to a supplement. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. So a lot of times people say, well, I'll just take a vitamin D supplement, a vitamin B supplement, and a whole bunch of omega-3s and zinc that, you know, can be better than nothing, but it's definitely better to get it in your food because your body absorbs it much better. Um, foods that we know can help with anxiety symptoms um, are some of the same. So omega-3 fatty acids, you find them in salmon, you find that in um, lots of different kinds of oily fishes, um, olive oil, things like that. Citrus fruits, um, green tea, um, certain cheeses that have uh, glutamine in them and soybeans. Um, so there's some evidence for all of these to be helpful um, for anxiety conditions. Now, this is not to, to suggest that if you eat a whole bunch of salmon, you're not gonna be depressed or anxious, but these things have evidence that they are beneficial um, and usually in addition to um, other treatment modalities like medication or ther psychotherapy. Um, just about herbs and supplements, because a lot of times people don't want to take medications. They would like a more natural approach um, for treating different health issues, including depression and anxiety. So this is a table that really um, is summarizing the evidence that we have basically for some of the most common things that people want to take for um, depression um, and anxiety. So the one that has the most evidence is um, the top one, which is St. John's wort. Um, so this is, a, is it, the recommendation is that this can actually be a first line or a second line treatment for depression, um, for mild or moderate and even to severe depression. The thing I'll say about St. John's wort and all of, all of these is they're not regulated by the FDA. So you want to make sure if you're going to take them, you get it from a, um, a place that's reliable. Um, with St. John's wort, be, I, you would always want to talk to your doctor before you consider using that for depression because St. John's wort has a lot of interactions with other medications you might be taking. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend just running out to the store and getting St. John's wort and taking it. You definitely want to talk to your doctor about them. Um, Omega-3s have pretty good um, evidence for them, at least as an adjunctive treatment to, um, you know, medications you might be taking for depression. Um, SAMe is something that was very popular a number of years ago. There is a little bit of evidence that that can be helpful. Um, and then all the other ones are much less so. So these are some of the other things that have been studied. Um, so those are some of the herbs and supplements. And actually, before I get on to exercise, I did not include in there and, and probably should have, um, but very common question lately um, that we get, I'm sure that you might have, is what about um, CBD and uh, marijuana, right? Because marijuana is um, legal in New Jersey, uh, available, you can get it in New Jersey, not be, um, um, it's, it won't become a legal problem for you in Pennsylvania, not yet, but there's medical marijuana. Um, and you can get a medical marijuana card for anxiety, like anxiety, you know, PTSD specifically, but also just anxiety. And a lot of folks will go do that because they want something that's more natural. But, you know, um, there is no evidence that um, marijuana is the THC specifically part of marijuana is um, it helps anxiety disorders. In fact, it tends to make them worse when they do study it. There is some evidence that CBD can be helpful for anxiety, um, not depression, but anxiety disorders. Um, but the evidence is kind of weak. So, you know, what I usually recommend to my patients is, you know, certainly um, I, if you have depression or anxiety to not take any preparation of marijuana that has THC in it, because um, it's going to cause more trouble than it's going to be helpful. And um, with regard to CBD, you know, um, you know, use with caution, um, you know, with the, um, with the caveat that of course that's not regulated either by the FDA. So that's just a word about that. Um, exercise, another lifestyle intervention is very helpful um, for treating mood and anxiety um, problems and also preventing them. So we know exercise bolsters our immune system. It decreases that cortisol that gets secreted with fight or flight. Um, you release endorphins that feel good, feel like the runner's high, it decreases your muscle tension, um, you improve your sleep and you can, you just feel 
you know, better, more productive, typically in confident, um, regular exercise. When they look at the different, uh, when they look at exercise and certain other physical sort of lifestyle treatments for depression and anxiety, um, some have pretty good evidence, some less so. So exercise can be even a first line treatment for mild to moderate depression. So it's, um, it is a recommendation light therapy. So this lady um, with her bright light on her face while she's looking on her phone, uh, light therapy is a first line treatment actually for seasonal affective disorder. So that's folks who every winter, like this time of the year, especially get down in the dumps, feel really lethargic. Um, so light therapy is extremely effective for that, but light therapy is also recommended as a second line treatment for good old fashioned depression. Um, so that there's pretty good evidence for light therapy yoga. There's some evidence as a second line kind of intervention, um, and less so acupuncture. Um, I don't even want to talk about sleep deprivation because nobody's going to recommend you do sleep deprivation, but there were some interesting studies, um, in Europe where they did sleep deprivation for treatment of depression. Um, so don't do that. Get good sleep actually. Um, and then I just want to finish my part by um, talking about, you know, we've mentioned yoga. So this is not the kind of yoga that we're talking about, obviously. And this is not the kind of yoga that Nancy McCormack will be leading you through later on in this presentation. But I put it up there because I wanted to mention alcohol. Um, so alcohol is a very common substance that many of us ingest, uh, you know, at times. It is often used to self-medicate depression and anxiety. Um, the problem is, however, that alcohol as a drug, as a chemical, it causes depression, actually. It doesn't help with depression. Um, and it does, while it might in the immediate feel like it's helping anxiety, um, it actually makes you have worse anxiety when you're not drinking and it interferes with your sleep patterns. Um, so alcohol is certainly something that you want to keep at a very at a minimum and certainly not to use it to self-medicate um, for depression and anxiety so again if you're depressed you want to not feel depressed so a lot of folks grab a couple of drinks to kind of escape that feeling but the alcohol causes depression and it's a, a vicious cycle so we want to try to avoid that all right, so that is my part. And now I'm going to pass it over to Victoria, who's going to start by talking about psychotherapy as treatment um, for depression and anxiety. Thank you, Dr. Weston. So that was so very informative and very helpful. So we all know about the mind, body and mind connection, and that's why it's so important to talk about um, our emotional health and, and how do we uh, acquire emotional health? What are some of the means that we have to get there? And, and um, when we talk about psychotherapy, we want to talk about um, the effect that psychotherapy has on gaining insight into our feelings, into our emotions. Um, by learning to know how we feel in certain situations, how we respond to certain situations, and maybe even learning some of the root causes of those responses or behaviors, then we are empowered to be able to do something about that, right? So if we're not responding well to stress, if we identify that, um, we're not really doing any self-care, then we're empowered to maybe start some of those behaviors that can contribute to emotional health. Um, stress management, learning relaxation te techniques, um, and again, regaining more control of our inner emotions and our inner feelings and how we express those, um, you know, um, outside of ourselves. So, um, Psychotherapy can take, it's also referred as a talk therapy, and it's because through talking that we get to gain that insight, that we get to gain that knowledge. It's really a process of introspection uh, where we are guided by a, by a trained psychotherapist uh, through a process of examination, a process of observation of our own mental and, and, and emotional self. So um, there are many times of psych there are many ways in which we can uh, conduct psychotherapy uh, through different interventions and the, some of the most common ones are cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, dialectic or behavioral therapy, um, ACT, which is acceptance commitment therapy, 
Um, Dr. Wesson, I'm not there yet, but that's okay. <laughs> there you go, thank you. Psychodynamic psychotherapy, um, the EMDR, which is more of a trauma-focused uh, therapy intervention, and we can use one or a combination of all in, during our sessions, depending on what the goals are, uh, so that we can help uh, the, the the patient in psychotherapy um, reach uh, the goals. And of course, we're doing all this in consent and in agreement uh, through our uh, contract and intera interactions in therapy. Um, now, how do we cope with depression and anxiety? Uh, that will be the next slide. And there are many ways that we can do that. And we have a list here of some of the most common coping skills meditation, deep breathing techniques, guided visualization, progressive muscle relaxation, prayer, yoga, and then lastly, mindfulness. And the one thing that I wanted to stress about this list here is that they all have a common denominator. And that common denominator is actually mindfulness. It is through each of those coping skills that we achieve a sense of awareness. And that's really what mindfulness is. So when we're talking about psychotherapy as, as a, a, a treatment, uh, as a way of gaining that insight, is because through psychotherapy, we can learn some of these coping skills that would lead us to that knowledge. So meditation, there are many kinds of meditation. There could be walking meditation, deep breathing, um, uh, mindfulness meditation, um, guided visualizations can definitely be um, a, a process in which you listen to a guide that is going to help you envision um, a, a, an image, a situation that is going to bring relaxation, a sense of calm and tranquility and safety. Progressive muscle relaxation is really a, a wonderful skill because it, it allows you to um, become more in tune with your body. Pay attention to your body. How does it feel? Uh, what areas of my body are not felt or are numb, um, and that's okay. So it's a very um, it's a very useful relaxation uh, or coping skill. Prayer is also known to be um, means for awareness. Just because uh, there is a process of repetition through prayer that kind of lead us to be present in the moment. Uh, through prayer. Yoga, we will be doing some of that at the end of the session. Uh, so it's mindful movement. Um, and again, it's paired with the, our breath. So it's a combination, again, of that mind-body uh, that is so helpful. Next slide. So what is mindfulness? Really, uh, what I want to um, stress about this slide is, is that mindfulness is a non-judgmental observation of oneself. So we hear a lot, oh, I can't meditate uh, because I, I just don't know how. I just can't do it. And the reality is, is the, the only fact that you appreciate that you're unable to do it is actually, or that is difficult or that is challenging, it is actually a piece of mindfulness because you are now aware that there are challenges when you try to engage into these mindfulness exercises. So through a lot of uh, patience and practice, you may be able to see that that inability, quote unquote, that we feel of, of being mindful or practicing a meditation may change with time. So just being very patient with the process um, can certainly uh, be very helpful. Next slide. Okay, so benefits of mindfulness. There are many benefits of mindfulness. It decreases rumination because it allows to identify that the rumination is happening, right? So when we feel that we are very stressed, we have a lot of things on our plate, but when we really think about what is it that is going through my mind, we might be really able to figure out that it's really one or two things that are the basis of that feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, so that if we're aware of that rumination, we can do something about it and we can stop that cycle. Um, it is going to enhance memory and attention. There are many studies that are done uh, because um, that, that indicate that it improves attention, concentration, that retraining or training of your brain to bring in your mind to a 
to the breath or bringing your mind to the guided imagery if your mind wanders that bringing back to the present moment constantly is training your mind to to pay attention to stay with um, it improves emotion reducing emotion regulation there is definitely a, a direct impact in our um, mind and our physical response um, so that through our breath we can definitely uh, ignite or start the relaxation response what is going to improve that that um, emotion regulation is going to help us manage the stress through that mind and body connection and igniting that relaxation response we're going to decrease heart rate body temperature as well is it's decreased um improves the sleep so that if you are unable to sleep at night and we're going to talk about sleep hygiene practices um sometimes including some mindfulness meditations maybe some prayers some of those coping skills that we mentioned before can get you to be relaxed enough so that you can find a sleep or that a sleep can find you, which is what we like to um, say better. Um, it's going to improve immune functioning. It's There are studies as well that show that um, mindfulness is beneficial by uh, reducing markers of inflammation that are responsible uh, for weakened immune systems that may lead to chronic disease. So uh, it does help with the immune response. Next is, oh, and then increases relationship satisfaction. Yes, just because of everything that we just said, by being having that level of awareness, being more um, in emotional control, uh, we having more uh, tolerate tolerance for distress, uh, being more present is definitely going to impact our relationships uh, with others. I wanted to quickly uh, demonstrate box breathing. This is a very common uh, technique that is used for stress reduction. So that, for example, just before I was coming in, I'm not great with uh, public speaking. I always get very anxious, very nervous. So that before I came on, I was really doing my box breathing. And if you can, please, um, I don't see you, but I trust that you are um, willing to participate in this exercise. It's very short. So I'm going to ask you to just uh, relax right where you are, just where you are. And I want you to take a deep breath into your nostrils or through your mouth, wherever is comfortable for you. You're going to breathe in for four seconds. You're going to hold that breath for four seconds. Then you're going to breathe out of your mouth or your nostrils, whatever is comfortable for you for another four seconds. We're going to hold that for four seconds and we'll start again. So I'm going to invite you to do it with me now. So breathing in, one, two, three, four, hold it, three, two, one. Letting go for four, hold it. I'm breathing in again, one, two, three, four, hold it for four and letting it go for four, three, two, one, and hold. So that is the box breathing, and you can do it for as many, as many times as you want to, uh, to engage that parasympathetic nervous system, that, that system that is going to create the, re to, to give you that relaxation response. So deep breathing and letting go for four seconds, holding it for another four, four seconds and starting the cycle again. So just remember that and be patient with it. Um, if four is too long for you, you can do two. Um, modify it. It's got to be comfortable and then be patient with the process and it can be helpful. Some other uh, things that we can do to decrease anxiety and depression, good sleep hygiene. Um, I know that um, our medical doctors, providers talk to us often about the sleep hygiene, but what are some of the things that we can do? Usually creating a, a, a bedtime routine can be helpful. Your mind and body kind of learn that this is what we start doing when we're ready, getting ready to go to bed. So uh, you're, you're setting a biological clock um, and that might be helpful. Limit caffeine, alcohol, and other stimulants. 
Um, hopefully your bathroom is a place that is conducive for relaxation. So having a nice, uh, uh, you know, environment for you to relax, minimize electronics at least two hours before bed. Um, can all those be good practices? Be careful with uh, power napping or napping during the day as it might disrupt your cycle. Um, and then be assertive and set limits. Uh, sometimes we overdo it um, and we need to be reminded that we don't have to do it all. So be assertive and understand when it, enough is enough and when you need to set those limits. Uh, take breaks if you're working through a special project. Make sure that you take breaks in between relax, a stretch, that usually is going to help you with coming back with more clarity. Routine, creating a routine for your day as well can be helpful because it's a form of, of, of organization. When we are organized, when we're planning, that is better than worrying, right? So when we engage in into a routine, we have a plan for the day. And therefore, we don't have to worry about what we have to do or don't have to do because you kind of already have that set for you. So having a routine can be helpful if possible, but having flexibility as well is important so that if your routine cannot be kept for any reason, that you can understand that that's okay and that you can always try that routine again the next day. Distraction, definitely use distractions for mood enhancement to decrease that anxiety and that depression. Listening to music, listening to um, food for soul pod podcasts, uh, playing with your kids, playing with your pets is always very helpful. So make sure that you get that into your routine as well. Um, so now we are, this is our wheel and we are going next to the environmental health. So we wanna create an environment that supports our well-being. Environmental health refers to the relationship between humans and our external world, our surroundings, whether they are natural surroundings or whether they are man-made surroundings, um, because our environment does have an impact on our health. Engaging in behaviors that um, protect our environment is going to enhance our sense of well-being, such as energy conservation efforts, recycling, not littering. So sending those messages to our children as well it, it is empowering and it can give us a good sense of control, which in turn can help with, us, with that anxiety that we sometimes have about our environment and the changes in the environment right now, such as, you know, the events of the pandemic. So doing things to preserve our health uh, by finding ways to help our environment um, is always helpful. Promoting the interaction between nature and our personal environment. Always finding a way to get out there, um, go for nature work, walks if possible. Um, taking time to breathe in that 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 nature you know through nature walks mindful walks that allow you to be uh in that connection also keeping in mind that your home environment your work environment are also key so a home that is clean free of clutter um it's most most times conducive to less stress um, and we know that less stress is going to be helpful with anxiety and depression, minimizing that. Financial health, we want to feel that we have a plan for our future financially. And planning for it is really key. Um, many problems um, in, in mental health can be intrinsically related to, to financial uh, issues. Poor management of finances can lead to stress, can lead to anxiety, and can have a, an, a more negative impact on our ability to appropriately plan for that. Behaviors such as gambling, compulsive buying, those need attention, and those can be treated. Intellectual health, uh, it's really recognizing that it's never too late to start and learn something new to ignite curiosity. Um, our, uh, our brain, our adult brain can still create new connections and create new pathways. 
so that it can learn new things. So it's important to engage in creative and stimulated mental activities to expand our knowledge and our skills to reach our maximum potential. Um, getting a new hobby, such as playing an instrument, knitting, uh, joining a book club, club is always a good idea. Um, and mindfulness practices such as meditation, again, as I mentioned before, can be proven or have been proven and contribute to increase intellectual health and ability. Occupational health, this really refers to the ways in which we can improve our work-life balance. Uh, ways to achieve a happy and healthy workplace. I know that if you're listening to this, um, I know that can be challenging, but it is not impossible. Uh, it will certainly benefit you and everybody around you. The, the way we achieve this goal is by seeking occupations that, that reflect our values, working with organizations that have missions uh, that we believe in, and, and if we find that our work is meaningful, it can certainly help with that satisfaction in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Being mindful um, of the work-life balance is as well very important. I think that you know during the pandemic, a lot of us, you know, it was difficult when we were working from home to kind of differentiate, okay, uh, my work time is done and now this is family time so finding again that work by work life balance is very important and then working in an environment where you feel mentally and physically safe is as well very very crucial so making sure that uh, we work with administration and and with uh, those um, people that can influence that change if needed for for the safety um, of employees is is beneficial now uh, we're going to talk about in our mountain uh, social health social health is our ability to perform um, social roles effectively it's our ability to connect with other people developing a sense of belonging it's very important um, a support network that we can trust um, positive relationships with family and peers the ability to have intimate relationships with romantic partners. And all this can be achieved through positive communication, good communication skills, having empathy for others, and then having a sense of accountability for our behaviors and our actions, for our sense of responsibility for one another. So social health is all about that connection with people, positive connections, a positive support system. Um, it is pretty much the, the opposite of isolation. So always finding ways to build these connections is highly recommended. And when I is replaced with we, illness becomes wellness. That's very nice. That brings us to a spiritual health. So a spiritual health refers to developing a sense of values that help us find purpose. Spiritual health is really not religion. It's, the, it's a guide to the ways that we think, the things that we do, that ultimately, ultimately will lead us to a meaningful life. The spiritual health creates balance between the physical, the psychological, and social aspects of human life. So we can find a spiritual health through in many sources. Um, so making sure that that's part of your values, making sure that that's part of your day to day can also be a contributed to less anxiety, um, less depression through installing hope um, in our day to day life. So I think that's well, I end. Okay, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this really in any detail, but this is, I thought was a good summary slide. What we've been talking about, which if your goal is to um, feel balanced and be free from anxiety and depression, we have to attend to all of these things, all of which we talked about and have a holistic approach to our mental health. And when should you see a mental health specialist? Um, certainly, if you have um, anxiety, depression, other mental health issues that are grossly interfering with your life functioning, that's a good time to seek help. Um, you can always start with your primary care doctor, but also um, 
you know, we are here to help. This is our phone number and um, that's the number for both practices. And um, thank you. And so we're done. I think there were a couple questions in the chat. I don't know if we want to do that now or later. Um, certainly there was, there's actually one question. So I'm going to answer that in the chat if that's okay with everybody and we'll, we'll stop our part of this. All right, so we'll come to the yoga segment. I'm Nancy McCormack, and we'll do a little bit of diaphragmatic breathing. We'll do a little bit of centering, a very short little meditation and some postures, and then maybe a short little visualization. So we'll get right to it in the interest of time. So bring your feet to the floor. Bring your knees hip width apart. Feel your sitting bones on the chair. And then if you can, bring your spine back against the back of your chair. Let your hands rest in your lap. And if you're comfortable, close your eyes. Let your jaw release and your face soften. And just feel your feet on the ground. Feel your sitting bones on the chair. Feel your shoulder blades and your back resting against wherever it is you're sitting. And then bring your hands to your belly, one on top of the other. And breathe in through the nose, down through your throat. And let the breath come down through the different lobes of your lungs and feel the belly rise. And then on the exhale, feel the belly fall and let the breath come back up out through your nose. Breathe in through the nose, let the belly rise. Exhale, let the belly release and come back up out. The breath comes back out. Breathing in. And breathing out. Breathing in, two, three, four, and exhale, four, three, two, one. And take a few more of those deep belly breaths, just moving away from the stress response and into the relaxation response. Letting go shedding the layers of tension, and just becoming present to you sitting in your chair, breathing deeply, and letting go of tension. And just let your thoughts drift in and drift back out of your mind. Open your mind and open your heart for a few more breaths. And then take one more deep breath in. And let this exhale be really long and relaxing. Lengthen the exhale. And then you can gently open your eyes, bring your hands to your lap. And we're gonna do a little joint warming series. It's actually an anti-arthritic warming series called Pavan Muktasana. It's about 3000 years old. And it's going to warm the joints. We're gonna do some rotations. It's a nice way to start yoga practice. So pick up your leg and flex and point. Doesn't matter which leg, we're gonna do both and flex and point and flex and point the ankle and the foot, and then rotate the ankle around. And reverse direction. Good, and then draw your knee in, 
and open the leg. Draw the knee in, open the leg, leg in, and open the leg. Good, next time bring that knee in and let's rotate in the hip joint. So we've got our femur bone, the thigh bone, it goes all the way into the hip and we're rotating that around. And reverse. So we're gonna do a short sequence of this. And one more rotation and bring that leg down. So take the other leg, bring it into the air and flex and point and flex and point, flex and point and flex point. And rotate the ankle around. And reverse direction. Good, now bring the knee in and open the leg. Bend the knee, draw it up, open the leg, bend the knee, and open. This time bring the knee up and draw circles in the hip. Move that bone around in the hip joint. So this series is kind of like when the Tin Man oils the he uses his oiling can to oil the joints. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're lubricating our joints, moving the synovial fluid into the joint, warming it, softening it, and getting it ready for a practice. Lower the knees down. Bring your hands out in front, and let's flex, and let's lower. And open and close, open and close. And together we're going to rotate the wrists around and reverse. Good. Turn the palms to the ceiling. Tap your fingers to your shoulders and open and tap and open, tap and open. And this time, keep your fingers on top of your shoulders. Open the arms to the side. Open and close and open. Close and open and close. Good. Bring those hands down to your lap. We're going to drop our chin to our chest and lift the nose to the ceiling. Chin to chest. Nose to ceiling. And one more time, chin to chest. And nose to ceiling. Bring your head back to the center. Let's look over to the right. Come back to the center and slide the chin over to the left. And to the right. Over to the left. And one more time. Both sides. And back to the center. Good. Take your left arm, sweep it forward, and make a nice big rotation in the shoulder. Bring that hand back to your lap. Take your right arm, sweep it forward. And a big rotation there in the rotator cuff. Good. Two more times on each side. Nice big round circle. And the right arm. And the left. And the right. Okay. We're going to do what's called trunk circles. So we're gonna warm up the spine and the back, mostly the lower back. We're just, keep your hands on your knees. We're just gonna rotate our ribs over top of our hips. So it's called a trunk circle because we move the trunk around in a circle. So your hips stay where they are. The rotation is the ribs and the shoulders and the head and neck are gonna come along.
good. And let's reverse direction. And one more. Good. And another way to keep your spine subtle is to do what's called cat cow. So we're going to bring the chest forward, the chin, and the head. You're going to push your tailbone back. And then you're going to curl the tailbone under, pull your navel to your spine, and round forward, bring your chin to your chest. Press your head, your chest, and your ribs forward. Push the lower back and the tailbone behind. And then lower the tailbone, pull the navel in, and round. It's called cat-cow. So we're in cat when we round, and we're in cow when we lift and look up. And imagine it's like walking up a spiral staircase. You move one vertebrae at a time. And we'll do one more round, starting with the tailbone. Work your way up your spine. Lower the head. And then press the head forward, walking down the spine and lifting. Good. Come back to your chair. And allow a little bit of space between you and the back of your chair. We're going to come to airplane arm. We're going to do a nice easy twist. So starting at the lower spine, you're going to begin your rotation. So let the lower back rotate. The ribs are going to come into the rotation. And then the shoulders. And then bring your chin to your back shoulder. Maybe you can put your arm, your right arm behind you and press it into your chair. And then take your left hand and bring it over to your right knee. Inhale, take a nice deep breath. And exhale, just very gently come into this nice easy twist. Maybe your chin comes to the back shoulder. Take two more breaths. So all these twists are good for digestion. We inhale. We expand the organs, and then on the exhale, when we press the navel in, we squeeze those abdominal muscles in. Squeeze and release. We're creating a peristaltic movement in the digestive system. Helps move everything along. And then open up those airplane arms and gently release. Come back to the center. And we'll go to the other side. So we work our way from the base of the spine. Feel your sitting bones against the chair. Gently move up the lumbar spine, the lower back. Move the ribs. Move the shoulders. And drop that hand behind you. Find some place to put it down and secure against the chair. And this time the right hand comes to the left knee. Inhale, lengthen, get nice and tall. Lift up through your heart center. And exhale, maybe bring your chin to the back, towards your back shoulder, if your neck is okay with it. So be mindful of any injuries or anything that's going on and modify the practice for you. And we'll take two more breaths here, nice and easy twist. And bring the arms back out to airplane arm. And very slowly release the twist. Bring your palms together at your heart. And inhale, sweep the arms up. And exhale, big angel wings, wide circles. Bring your palms together, draw them to your heart. Inhale, sweep the arms up. Exhale, big circle. Inhale together, reach up, and exhale, circle. We're going to do what's called a forward fold. We're going to continue that. Bring the palms together. Inhale, sweep up. And next time we exhale, we're going to come forward. It's called swan dive. You're going to bring your belly to your lap. 
Bring your hands to your shins. Inhale, look forward. Exhale, reach the arms out to the sides. Pull your tummy in and come back up. Palms come together and we do that again. Swan dive, forward fold. Hands to your shins. Inhale, look forward. Exhale, sweep the arms out for reverse swan dive. We'll do that one more time. Inhale, lift up. Exhale, forward fold, sweep the arms. Inhale, look forward. And exhale, reverse swan dive. Good, bring your palms together. And we'll just come into a gentle closing visualization. So that's just a little tiny piece of what a yoga practice is like in the chair. Come back to planting your feet down on the ground, your knees over the chair in front of your hips. Rest your spine against the back of the chair. Feel your shoulder blades connect. And bring your hands to your left. And take another one of those deep diaphragmatic breaths. And just imagine a big ball of sunshine, an orb of light coming down into the crown of your head, bringing light energy, healing energy, and feel the warmth that the sun shines bringing. And let that orb of light come down through your head, your face, your neck. Bringing light, healing energy down into the chest, your shoulders, down into your ribs, all the organs inside your body. Let that white light, that healing light, come all the way down the back of your body, down through your spine. Feel the light come into your belly and swirl into your hips. And feel that wonderful sunshine, that orb of light, come down into your thighs, down to your knees. And feel that healing light come down and swirl around the bottom of your legs, down to your ankles, your feet, and into your toes. And just feel your whole body being bathed in white light, healing light, big orb of sunshine. Letting the layers of tension go. And then taking these last few breaths just to find gratitude for your body, gratitude for your heart, your mind. We've got you here in this wonderful workshop. And then take another deep breath and maybe find something else you're grateful for. And one more deep breath and finding yet one other thing that you're grateful for today. And then when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes come back into the room. And in yoga, we finish our class, our sessions. We bring our palms to our heart center and we bow to one another. We say namaste. Namaste means the light in me honors the light in you. And I know you're all filled with light right now. Thank you for coming and sharing this workshop with us. I'll let Christy and Victoria wrap things up. And have a lovely night. <laughs>